first of all, I would like to say how sad we are for those we lost in the earthquakes of Turkey and Syria, and in the recent train accident in Greece, and of course for all the civilians we lost, women and children in Ukraine, every single life lost in imperialistic wars such as this one. I also want to thank you for being a part of this empowering event, organizing such an event. It means a lot for your sisters in Turkey. My name is Fulya Alikoç, as announced, and I am, I'm a member of the editorial board of Etmek ve Gül. Uh, for those who are not familiar with the, who we are, <laughs> the direct translation of our name is Bread and Rose obviously named after the working class women's struggle for equal pay, right to vote and liberation uh, in the beginning of the 20th century. We are a nationwide women's network in Turkey, organized around a woman, uh, a monthly uh, journal and a daily based working website. We also publish a weekly page in the daily printed newspaper around site on every Sunday. In our network, there are seven women's associations and local ECMECBE groups in 22 different cities and many university groups and student clubs. Actually, this is the network of solidarity we mobilized immediately after the earthquake. And it's growing since we made a call for the campaign. We rebuilt the life through the sisterhood bridges. So... Dear sisters, uh, I want to summarize the post-quake situation in Turkey in several points and questions I imagine you might have. First, why did these earthquakes cause such a destruction in Turkey? Why they were so destructive? That's a relevant question because they weren't listed among the biggest quakes in the known human history. Their magnitudes were 7.8 and 7.6 after all, not even close to a magnitude of uh, 9, but the damage they caused was among the biggest. It's 32nd day of the disaster today, and the official death toll is 46,130. The exact number, it is impossible to know, but we know that much more than this. 11 cities were immediately affected. It's an area populated by more than uh, 13 million people. Again, officially, the President Erdogan announced 230,000 buildings were to be totally or nearly destroyed. They're heavily damaged. So why all this destruction? It's actually an inevitable consequence of uh, 20-year-old policies of the Turkish government, Justice and Development Party and the President Erdogan adopted a strategy of economic growth based on at least two main things. One is cheap labor to invite foreign capital and investments. The second is supporting construction industry in the country. For this purpose, they dried out rivers, lakes, agricultural lands, etc. Et Many peasants fake poverty, being forced to move to cities as cheap labor force, while construction companies raise their buildings on these grounds, which were not suitable for construction, obviously. The result became catastrophic, as we have been witnessing for the last month. So my second point is about the search and rescue operation. I know it is hard to believe when someone tells you that the state did not come to save its citizens' lives in such a disaster, but unfortunately it is the truth. Disaster management of the government has also been profit-driven, not human-centric, as were its policies of the last 20 years. There are thousands of construction machines in the country, but none of them appeared during the first 72 hours on the ground. When the rescue machines appeared on the ground, people who have been screaming for rescue teams to save their loved ones from the rubble had to witness the teams saving 
ATM machines of the banks. Or on the third day, the Red Cross, who is supposed to save lives, survivors, support survivors, sold 2,050 tents to a charity while people were waiting for rescue in the freezing cold. Then we learned that the staff of effort, one officially entitled body to run the search and rescue work, have been employed from the religious affairs and communities, not eligible for the job. Erdogan immediately declared a state of emergency under the pretext of maintaining security. He had all the power, but he did not use his power to suspend stock exchange, for example, allowing big companies to make profit over the quake, make profit over the that people in the region. Just like the government, the employers in the region were also more, more concerned about their profits. They called workers who lost their relatives, homes, whatever they have, to come back to factories, to production. The government did nothing about that either. So another point which government did not did nothing about is the needs of women. Imagine yourself standing by the rubble once you called home in the freezing cold, in the utter absolute darkness, hearing the voices under the wreckage, calling for help, in fear of death and losing your loved ones. You would naturally wait for help, so did our sisters in the region. Hours passed and no military forces, no rescue teams came. No clothes, no food, and no water supply. When the daylight came, many women walked in the damaged buildings to get some food for their families, while men went seeking something to get warm. Then the second quake hit. Those women were caught in the damaged houses. Again, imagine yourself in such a situation, having your period. This conservative government did not put hygiene pads, tampons, in their lists. Such sexism was also at work on the ground in such a situation where women need more women, more females to have to communicate. Afat did not allow women to be part of post-quake work because they are women. Or it refused giving tents to women because they are not family. This attitude makes sense when you consider the a 20-year-old policy that women are valuable as long as, as long as they're part of a family. So all in all, we actually heard it from the first time when President Erdogan said a few years ago, quote unquote, a woman is not complete if she is not a mother. So now imagine yourself waiting to be a mother, I mean, being pregnant in the middle of this nightmare. Many women gave birth to their babies under the brackage, under the collapsed buildings. Only few survived. According to United Nations Population Fund, there were 214,325 pregnant li women living in the affected region. And approximately 24,000 of them were expected to deliver their babies within a month. So it's been a month. There is no official data about their situation now. We don't know what happened to them. We also don't have true knowledge of children without parents or guardians. There are at least 1,000 children recorded as missing. Some were delivered to religious sects and communities, and they erected crown courses in the region for children of ages four to six, children who have been traumatized with no access to toilets, no access to decent sheltering, regular food or water supplies, but they have access to religious missionary force now, which becomes a secondary traumatizing effect on kids of this age. So, oh, what is the current situation of women, especially, of course? 
hundreds of thousands of people had to move temporarily or permanently to other parts of the country. Those who had to stay behind are trying to live in tent cities. Some are still on the streets, actually. The need for toilet uh, is still vital. Women are choosing not to drink or not to eat so that they wouldn't have to go to the toilets. They push the limits of human body by going to toilet once in a day, preferably in the darkness of the night. This in turn causes severe health issues. Vaginal infections are growing in number. Additionally, going to toilet in the dark makes many women vulnerable to sexual and other attacks. And unfortunately, it is a known fact that we know that there happens an increase in the gender-based violence cases in the post-disaster environment. It has been more than a month now, and there is still no governmental body in the region for women to apply in case of such violations. To help you picture the situations, one gynecologist who wants to keep her name secret reported to us that she so three rape victims a day during her visit on the ground. One doctor witnessing three rape cases, rape cases a day. This is the real disaster. So what do we do in face of that such disaster and what you can do, sisters abroad? Ekmek ve Gül immediately mobilized women in its network. So some were already living in the region, actually. We formed a coalition coordination among those women's associations and ECMEC degree groups and university uh, groups, student clubs, etc. Et we installed prefabricated small houses and tents specifically for women and children, where they can find uh, hygiene pads, tampons, some basic medicine. Health workers in our network are voluntarily on the ground to carry medical screening, screening, especially in the countryside. They actually going uh, from village to village now. Psychologists, pediatricians, and social workers who are ECMEC volunteers are going to the region to provide psychosocial support, and we are installing uh, tents for children. Sky tents, we call them. It will take a very long time for women and children to overcome this disaster. So all these works will need an ongoing and sustainable support. This is what we are tr working hard to organize now, and why actually we comfortably appeal to the our appeal to our sisters all around the world. First of all, the living conditions of women in the region should be known everywhere that that the Turkish government is lying about the whole situation, about the situation of women uh, in particular, that women had to deal with state sexism and capitalist greed for pro profit, even in such a disastrous moment. So we would love to strengthen our communication with women's organizations all around the world, and there is already ongoing solidarity network in Europe, our sister organizations um, like Migrant uh, Women's Association. You are very welcome to get in touch with them and show your support in an organized way. Uh, we report our needs on a regular basis to our sisters there, so you can get in touch with them. Finally, I want to celebrate your 8th of March. International Working Women's Day. This is what we uh, women in Turkey rely upon, uh, women's solidarity and organized struggle for equal and liberated world. We survived upon solidarity, actually. We're going to change the world by getting organized. So long live women's international solidarity and thanks for listening. <laughs>